All right. Welcome, everybody, to Archive Dives with Ox and AI, where every week we dive into interesting research papers and try to tease out the key insights that you can apply to your own machine learning projects. If you're new here, welcome. We do this every Friday with the Oxen AI community. The team at Oxen AI during the week specializes in building tools to help you collaborate and iterate on your machine learning data sets. Think Git plus GitHub, but if you could store CSVs with millions of rows plus directories of multimodal data, like images, video, audio, and text all in a single repository. Many of these papers we go over on Fridays are all about the data, and today is no different. Uh, we're going to be going over the Depth Anything paper, which is a really cool technique and brings me back to some of my days of working in augmented reality and virtual reality, but has a lot of other interesting use cases um, that we'll dive into. And so I'll be sharing this Notion doc that we can all follow along with. It is uh, from the teams at TikTok and uh, University of Hong Kong. And I actually don't know how to pronounce this university, but Lillian, you might be able to help me out with that <laughs> afterwards. Um, and what's really cool about this paper is they are able to go from a single RGB image to a depth map of the scene. Um, so they call this monocular depth estimation. And it has a lot of different interesting use cases. If you're not from the computer vision world, um, this is just to kind of give you a sense of the wide variety of things you could apply this technology to. So anything from self-driving cars, like how far are all the objects on the road, robotics, where the surface is, I could place my coffee mug, augmented reality, like head tracking and placing virtual things in the scene, special effects, uh, Snapchat filters. There's even some cool guided generative image techniques called control net if you want to look that up, but they kind of like use these depth maps to give stable diffusion more guidance on what to generate. So a lot of use cases, and I feel like we've been deep in language modeling land. So I'm excited to come back to computer vision land um, where I know a lot of us live. So um, I wanted to also get started just because this is my background and I love to nerd out on it with some like actual real world examples of how I've used the, these depth maps in the past. And if anybody else has used them to build applications, I would love to like chat about that um, and dive into, dive into what you're building. But enter this startup that I worked on like six years ago. Um, we were trying to build a real-time streaming um, human reconstruction in augmented reality. So I have like a crappy video here of what we built. Oh no, it's going to take forever to upload this thing. <laughs> I was really hoping we could do some live videos. All right. So this is me streaming in these live video into a 3D scene. And I go into this other room that has like a Microsoft Connect setup here. Um, you can kind of see it. But then I use depth estimation from the connect as well as segmentation to like cut myself off or segment myself out and stream live into the augmented reality scene. Um, I feel like applications like this are going to get more and more accessible as we can start doing this monocular depth estimation directly from single RGB images. And you can kind of like drop the Microsoft Connect and do this live just from a video stream. And what's cool is from the, the GitHub that they have here, um, they released three different models that can do this. And on single GPU, they can all run over 50 frames a second, which is pretty ridiculous. Um, so if anybody like wants to hack with me on a practical dive of doing this, we have 
some people working on the self reinforcing language models for a practical dive coming up. But I also think this would be a really interesting one to get in the queue. So uh, hit me up if you want to work on that. But diving into what a depth map is in general, um, all of this can be run on hugging face in this space right here. I took an example of me standing here with my arms out and ran it through. And you can see that for every pixel in the image, it also has a corresponding depth value. So like my hands are a little closer than my body. This table is definitely closer and then my dog is farther away in the background. And so what's cool about this is you can take all of those points and turn them into a 3D point cloud. So this is like the 3D version of what uh, this 2D depth map looks like. Um, and this is just me rendering it in a 3D program here. You can see it's like pretty noisy, but it kind of gives you a rough, rough estimation where everything is in the scene. And what's cool is Scott and I, in a previous life, used these point clouds to build an augmented reality fitness application. Um, so you can see we put this like punching bag in front of me. And if my hand goes forward enough in that area, it actually hits the bag and moves it. Um, so really cool. We were grabbing these depth maps like directly from the iPhone true depth sensor on the on the front end of the phone. But um, just wanted to give you some like concrete examples of these are applications like any of us could download this model and, and run cool stuff like that. Um, diving into like how all of the data for this traditionally has worked. Uh, usually you need extra hardware or expensive compute techniques to be able to get a depth map of the scene. Um, so either you have stereo cameras that kind of work like the human eye uh, to triangulate points in the scene and find matching correspondences between these two images to do the three, 3D reconstruction, or they do a technique called structure for motion where you're like moving a camera through the scene, also trying to find corresponding key points and reconstructing the 3D object that way. Um, and finally, there's like depth sensors like LIDAR or structured light that will have additional sensors within your camera to either project dots into the field and have uh, a like infrared camera be able to pick up the pattern and reconstruct the 3D object things like the depth sensor on the front of your iPhone. And now I guess they have a lighter on the back of it. Do this. Um, but there's a lot of problems with each one of these sensors beyond the fact that they're just more expensive than just having a pure RGB camera. Um, stereo cameras don't work great if you have like flat surfaces, like a white wall to your side because they're trying to find matching key points in each image. Uh, and if it's just a white wall, it's really hard to find those matching key points. Structure for motion has the same problem as stereo cameras because you're trying to find these correspondences. Um, but it's also like a really expensive algorithm to run and usually has to be done offline. Depth sensors add this expensive hardware and do work well on surfaces that are like flat and white, but don't work great on shiny metallic surfaces where the light might bounce in a bunch of different directions. So what's cool about this paper is they take data from all three of these styles of sensors, combine them all into a massive data set, as well as grab a giant unlabeled corpus of data. And they combine all of this into like a mega data engine that they use to train this model where they can go from a single RGB image to a depth map. Um, so with all of that preamble, let's dive into what depth anything does. Um, so you can see their, their diagram here. They have kind of the labeled images, unlabeled images, labeled predictions, and then they have 
either LIDAR matching or structure for motion, like those techniques that I talked about above, or they have unlabeled images that they run through a pre-trained model to get pseudo labeled images of scenes that they didn't have from any of these like sensors out in the wild. And they argue since the internet has so much more unlabeled data than they do labeled data, um, if they can create a data engine that uses one model to annotate the data and then train a new model on that annotated data, they can get much wider diversity of data as well as combine it with the label data that they have um, from these more structured sensors. So what they start with, and they mentioned this model many times within the paper, is that there was a previous model called MIDAS um, that was trained on just the annotated data from depth sensors. Um, and they noticed that this model does great on the, the distributions of data that they're able to collect in the real world, but really fell apart on like unseen situations. Like maybe it's, maybe it's like the fitness application that we were building and the person sets their phone in their dark basement and they're in their black sweats. And like, it just has never seen data from that distribution before. So what they want to do is uh collect a data set that has images from all of those different distributions um and combine like a labeled data set with an unlabeled data set to make this massive kind of pseudo label data set that can hopefully beat this midas model um so you'll see it mentioned a lot in the paper and there's the link to the to the actual paper there um they claim that leveraging the unlabeled images in their pipeline increases the model's ability to generalize. And so at the end of the day, they collect 1.5 million labeled images and 62 million unlabeled images. And they do it from a few different data sets that are out there. Um, and you can see they kind of mark them with where they collected with stereo cameras or where they collected with structure for motion. There's also a bunch of LIDAR data sets that were mentioned in this MIDAS paper um, that I think they used. But in this case, uh, the depth anything starts with a mixture of these six data sets, which is a total of like 1.5 million labeled images. And the first thing they do is they train a base uh, depth estimation model, which uses a dyno v2 model as the image encoder and then what's called a dense prediction transformer as the decoder so this is like your standard encoder to decoder model um, where honestly you could probably swap in a plethora of models for the encoder and a plethora of models for the decoder they just happen to use dyno v2 and this dbt in their case. And in the first round, they just train the supervised version where they have the actual ground truth from LIDAR um, stereo matching or uh, structure for motion. And what they do is after they train this initial model, uh, they go and unleash that model on all of the unlabeled images that they got from these, what is it, eight data sets of just like ImageNet 21K or uh, even the segment anything 1 billion data set that we saw in a previous archive dive. So this set of unlabeled data is trying to get a wide variety of everything from like cats, dogs, to buildings, to uh, complex scenes but none of these have their actual labeled annotations. So they take the model that they trained in this first step and go and create what they call pseudo labels on all of the unlabeled imagery, which aren't going to be perfect. 
um, you know, it does give a wider variety of images that it sees, but it's going to make the same mistakes on these unlabeled images in general. So the key inside of this paper is how can you use these pseudo labels with some interesting data augmentation techniques and interesting uh, loss function to correct some of those mistakes and make the unlabeled uh, or pseudo labeled images as effective as the labeled ones. Um, so this kind of pipeline is usually traditionally called a student teacher pipeline where you have like a teacher model that knows how to annotate the data and then a student model that's learning from it. Um, and so, like I said, the problem is the student model, um, isn't going to beat the teacher model by simply training on the data outputted by the teacher model. Yes, they're different images, but it's going to make the same mistakes. So to optimize or to address this problem, and I actually think this is like this pattern that we're seeing in this computer vision paper is very similar to the patterns we've started to see in the DPO paper in text or like this synthetic data um, pipelines in text. So I'd, I'd want to keep those in the back of your mind as we're going through this. So the first thing they do is they add strong perturbations to the unlabeled images during training. So everything from like your classical computer vision pipeline of like flipping the images or rotating them or um, cropping them to color distortions, Gaussian blurring, and other distortions. Like they mentioned this cut mix, which is kind of like cropping out things and putting them, putting other images into the same place. And so that's the first thing they do. And then the second thing they do is this auxiliary semantic segmentation feature alignment mask. Um, so when they're looking at these images, they're like, hmm, the depth maps are have a lot in quality of, or have a lot of things in common with like a traditional segmentation style task. So like knowing where the chairs are or the poles are or the trees are is going to give you a really interesting clue to where uh you know objects of the same type probably have a very similar depth value um so thinking of that um what they do is they have this technique and honestly if you if you're not familiar with the the first one, I have some examples here of just, they take the original image, they'll zoom in on it, they'll flip it, they'll color distort it, they'll add Gaussian blur, they'll add Gaussian noise, they'll cut out different parts of it. So that's number one here. Um, and number two is they take, they add a secondary loss to the optimization which they are calling a feature alignment loss. And they start with the Dino, um, the Dino 2 model, which I honestly wish we kind of did a, an archive dive on this before because it's a super interesting model from Meta. Um, I'll actually bring it up here so we, so we can kind of see all the different things we can do. But they, they trained this kind of backbone of a model that can do everything from depth estimation to semantic segmentation to instance retrieval to dense map matching, sparse matching. Um, and so this is like another foundation model that had been trained. And so this one already knows how to do semantic segmentation. And so what they do is they start with the Dino V2 as their encoder. Um, so this step within here, and they get a feature map out of the encoder and they actually freeze that Dino V2 encoder. Cause it knows a lot of things like semantic segmentation or those other tasks that it had done. And as they're going through and training the step estimation model on the, the mix of labeled and unlabeled data. They start to measure the cosine similarity between the feature vectors 
that came out of the original Dino V2 model to the feature vectors that are coming out of this model that they're training on the labeled and unlabeled data. And it's kind of similar to the DPO paper that we went through a few weeks ago where they don't want um, the things that this new model is learning to drift too far away from the old model that has nice properties like being able to segment out images or do depth maps in general. Um, and since they're adding all this noisy unlabeled data, they're like, we want it to learn features about this data, but we don't want it to lose any of the functionality from the original model. So they add in this like cosine similarity feature loss within the pipeline. Uh, and that's like one of the key tricks to get this to work in general um, and not just learn off of the pseudo labels mixed with the manual labels. They even say that if you just mix the pseudo labels with the ground truth, like labels from the cameras itself, the model doesn't get better. But as soon as you add in these data augmentation techniques and this auxiliary um, feature space loss technique, that's where they actually saw the benefit of adding the new label, the new unlabeled data. Any questions there so far? Cool. So then they take uh, six data sets that they left out of the labeled training data set in order to evaluate. So they have Kitty, uh, NY, V2, all of these ones with really crazy names. Um, and they start by comparing it to that Midas model that we talked about at the start. So what's interesting is Midas had been trained on 3 million labeled uh, labeled images and depth anything started with only 1.5 million labeled images, but started mixing in the unlabeled as they were training the student. And what they show is uh, all of these six data sets were not in the original um, in the original set of labeled data that we saw here, but they were in the Midas training set in terms of they like split them into test and valid and Midas had seen data from these distributions before where depth anything had not, but since depth anything mixed in all of that unlabeled data and pseudo label data, it outperformed Midas on all of those um, all of those data sets, even though they hadn't seen data from this distribution explicitly. Um, so that was like the first thing that they were super encouraged by. And the fact that they started with less data and didn't show the model data from these distributions and it could still generalize was super interesting. Um, and what's even more is like the, they trained three of these, so like a VIT small, a VIT big and large, I think that stands for big. Um, and even the VIT small, which is a tenth, one tenth the size of Midas, outperforms it on a few of these data sets, um, like Sintel, DDAD, and ETH3D. Um, there was a question in the chat about the benefits of training their own encoder if they are kind of using Dino V2 um, or, or learning from Dino V2 and, and what the benefits were there. So they start with Dino V2 as the encoder, and then they're just trying to improve on it by adding more data. So Great. it's not like they're training one from scratch. Cool. So they're just like, they, they have those baseline weights and they're adjusting them through the addition of this additional data. Cool. Yep. Um, and so the next thing they wanted to see is since they, they call that step of the loss function, uh, this right here, where they're doing the cosine similarity between the frozen dyno model and the dyno model that they're improving over time, they call that the semantic priors that they want to keep in there. Um, and so they wanted to make sure that the model maintained its ability to do, to do semantic segmentation while also, or the, the encoder kept its ability to have high quality semantic segmentation features 
while also being able to do the depth estimation task. So what they do is they take um, this ADE 20K data set, fine tune the model for semantic segmentation and show that it even outperforms a lot of these other models um, on semantic segmentation given this task. So their argument there is that these semantic priors have been kept in the model because of that loss function that they added. Um, and their hope here is to highlight that techniques like this, um, it, their pre-trained encoder can be used as a backbone for many visual perception systems and that loss functions like this are really nice to like build off prior work. They also do a bunch of ablation studies. Um, so first they start with different training data subsets. Um, so they train six versions of the model, just keeping one subset of data at a time. Um, so they actually go ahead and do use these data sets that they had held out and split them into train and test um, and evaluate it on all of the other ones that it didn't train on. And what was super interesting is they found that the HRWSI data set actually scored the highest. When they fine tuned on that one, it scored the highest across all of the other ones, um, even though the HRWSI data set only contained 20K images. And if you remember, at the top here, um, some of these other data sets had like 115,000 or almost a million images, but this one had the most diverse set of images um, and so generalized much better to all of these other tasks. So I thought that was super interesting that it's more like quality and diversity might be what you need rather than just throwing a ton of data at it. Um, so that's the other interesting part about the unlabeled half is like they are getting this diversity of data, um, but they wanted to show that with the, with this experiment that that's why they think it works even better. Um, we also uploaded this data set to Oxen if you guys want to check it out. It has a bunch of these labeled pairs of image, depth map, instance mask, and validation mask. Um, and there's only like 20,000 images in there, but they said this one had the widest variety of data. Um, and then I mentioned that they did ablation studies on keeping just the labeled data, the unlabeled data, adding the strong perturbations and adding the feature loss. And so what they said was this L is the labeled data. This L is the unlabeled data. This is when you just add the strong perturbations. And this is when you add the feature loss. So when you add all four of them, uh, the model performs the best on all of these held out benchmarks. But what I thought was interesting is if you look at this, uh, lower is better. So if you just added the labeled and unlabeled data, it either stayed the same or even got worse on some of the metrics here. When you added in the strong perturbations, now it starts to get better at all of these data sets. And then when you add in the final uh, feature alignment of the encoder, it gets the best. Um, my next question was then, okay, but what if you just did the strong perturbations and the feature alignment with the label data, like left out this column right here? And they show um, that this does indeed help, but it helps even more if you add the unlabeled data and the labeled data together in here. Um, so this is unlabeled data 
this is labeled data. And you can see that when you add it with the unlabeled data, that's when they get the best performance, just because I think you see a higher variety of data within there. In this section, they say this is because the label data already has high quality depth annotations. The pseudo label data may have some mistakes, be noisier and less informative, but adding this auxiliary constraint to the unlabeled data can arm the model with other semantics in order to combat the noise. Um, and then finally, they compare it to the Dino V2, um, since Dino V2 could do um, the depth est estimation out of the gate. So they're like, how much did we improve on our base Dino V2 by adding all this data? And it improves on all of the tasks. So um, kind of this technique where you don't let the model drift too far away from the original model while adding synthetic data seems to be a pattern that we're seeing over and over again, whether it be DPO or, or these other techniques. Uh, they also had some super interesting quantitative results. So some of these are a little mind blowing to me. Um, so you can see like, this is the image that comes in and then this is the depth map that comes out. Uh, they did a pipeline where they took in the image, created the depth map, and then used the depth map as input to a generative control net to try to reconstruct the image back out. Um, and so when they ran the image through their pipeline, you can see they get a much higher quality feature map or depth map than Midas did. So then when you feed that depth map into your generative AI, it looks a lot closer to the original image where Obviously, this one just didn't have enough to go off there. Um, same with here, where you can see it even is picking up these very subtle um, fence posts within the image. Um, and Midas was not picking up any of that level of detail. Um, some other crazy qualitative results here. This is. This column is their prediction, and this column is the Midas V3 prediction. And you can see, like, I wouldn't even have a chance on this image, if I'm being honest. Like, uh, I probably would have missed that this tree is here, and this post is here, and Midas is giving this very noisy depth map. And you can see their prediction is just almost spot on here. Um, so these are kind of mind-blowing examples in my, in my mind. Um, at the end of the paper, they talk about some limitations of it. They say the largest model that they trained was VIT large, um, and it would be interesting to train a more powerful teacher at the start, like a VIT giant. They also mentioned that all of this work was on 512 by 512 images, which isn't super high resolution, so might not give the most practical depth maps for real world applications. They want to train a larger one at larger resolution. Um, and then my last question, which I didn't get an answer from in the paper, but like when you do this in the real world, when you have stereo cameras or you have like a LIDAR sensor, um, every single camera has like slightly different camera parameters and calibrations. So the fact that you're mixing all of these data sets means that the depth value for each one of the cameras is slightly different. So in the paper, what they do is they normalize all the depth values from zero to one. Um, and when you know the camera parameters, you can extend out into the real world where exactly those points, those Z points are in general. So I'm wondering how they address this if like the training data has uh, different camera parameters for everything, or if it just kind of magically works. Um, so I think that would be another thing to look at in a practical dive is like, uh, what do the values that look, look like when they come out of this neural network? And is, does it map directly to, if I had my iPhone camera and took a picture right in front of me, the Z value is like exactly 
10 centimeters away or is it more just like a generic zero to one this thing's behind that thing um so if there's any anybody that ha has seen work like this and knows that i would be curious if, if you guys have an answer for that um but honestly this was really fun just kind of going back to some of my computer vision days and and uh augmented reality days. I'm curious if anybody in the call also works in computer vision or self-driving cars or anything like that. I'd love to dive into your use cases or even like the generative ones. Um, and so with that being said, I'll, I'll kill the recording so we can talk offline. And thanks to everybody on the YouTubes watching. Uh, you, can, you can join this live at oxen.ai slash community. Um, and we'd love to have you because this last 20 minutes, in my opinion, is the most fun.